So today, uh, for the beginning of this message, I was praying. I was praying this week about God. What do I need to share with with people in Southside with your people? And He told me again, share your testimony. Share what God has done in your life. And it's not my first time I share my testimony with people uh, in, in the church. Since I gave my life to Christ, it's been a habit to share my testimony. I practice my testimony over and over. I do it in one minute. I do it in two minutes. I do it in 30 minutes. I do it in 40 minutes. Depends how much time you have. Since you are a captive audience for the next 30 minutes, just kidding. I will make it short. It is truly the greatest thing that God has done in our life that give us a new life. If you are born again, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The story, we have all have two stories. One story when you're born for the first time, and second story is when you're born again. I'm born in Iran, in the, in the country of Islamic Republic of Iran, in the northeast of Iran, city near Mashhad called Quchan. It's a small town, maybe as big as your town here. Your town is pretty big, actually. Maybe it's a little smaller. It's it's kind of cold. The weather a little bit cold. So it's when whenever I say I'm from Iran or Iran, I don't know. Uh, you guys say Iran or Persia or, or Iran. It doesn't matter. If people think I'm from sand. You know, it's 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 all sand. It, it, there is always hot camels, but no, it's actually cold. It snows. It's, 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 it's like here. Um, the north is cold. The south is hot. I was born in Iran. My family was um, very poor. Um, not comparing to poor, 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 but you know, comparing to my other uncles and aunts, we were pretty poor. We always rent a house. We move every year, so I have to change the school every year. And my parents did not have a good relationship. They, they fought all the time. They fight, 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 and I don't remember many times that they did not fight. They always live separate. You know, my dad go working, come back after two months, go working, come back after one year. And they always live separate. When I was 11 years old, my, my father and mother uh, gave birth to uh, my brother, who is here today. And when I was 11 years old, I got a little brother. And on that same year, before my brother was born, a few months before the, he, he was born, they decided to, we're going to separate completely. We're not going to come back again. This is not going to work out. I was sad and not sad at the same time. It was kind of weird because whenever they were together, they were always fighting. So I was thinking, just get separate. Just live separate. It's more easier. And always feel ashamed to want to say that. But I never said it. And, and the, at 11 years old, the, they, they got separate. My mom started going to work. She worked at a company. And my dad left the city. We didn't hear anything from him for about two years. When I was 12 years old, my mom decided that we're going to move to the capital city of Tehran because there's more jobs there. And she's a single mother. There's a lot of work behind her in a small town. So we decided to move to Tehran, to capital city. The city of Tehran have about 15 million people live in it. Very large city, a lot of work, a lot of people, and um, you can get job easier. So we rent a basement, and we went and lived there, my brother and I and my mother. In the city of Tehran, we lived about maybe eight months or so, and my father called my mother, and he wanted to make a deal with my mom. He said, I want to see my children growing up. So send them to me. I'm in the country of Turkey. And my mom, she was a single mother, and um, it was hard for her to raise us up. So she got our passport, and uh, we got into the bus. I was 13 years old at a, at a, at a time, and um, my brother was about two, two and a half or three years old. And we traveled with the bus, my brother and I, about 18 hours to the tor Turkey. We went to Turkey, and um, I, helped, I got help from some other people and worked out my papers and crossed the border. Over the border, my dad was waiting for us. 
My dad told me that he was a refugee, and that's why he couldn't come back to get us. When you are a refugee in the country of Turkey, you cannot go back to your country because you are applying that your life is not in danger in your country. Refugees are those who take refuge from their country to a different country because their life is in danger. So my dad explained to me that refugees are like this. We are, we are here, and, and I applied to the UN department. That's the United Nation of Refugees. And, and our case is that we don't like the regime, and I am a Christian now. I said, OK. My dad was not a good Muslim. He was, since, since we grew up in Iran, everybody are Muslim. You were you, you born Muslim. I was a Muslim, and I was a good one. I did. My, I started my, my, my prayer and my fasting at nine years old. Uh, I did completely. I served in the mosque. I sing in the mosque. Uh, I, I served in the uh, giving food away in the mosque. I was a good boy. But my father, no, he never read his prayer. He never did his fasting. And I was planning to take over his fasting and his prayer because the oldest son picked up the the fast and the prayer that he didn't do after his father dies. So I was very religious um, and, and always listening to the mosque, to the imam preaching. And when I was leaving Iran, my mom told me, Masood, if you go there and become Christian, I will not halal my milk to you. That means I will not forgive my milk when I give to you when you are young. And that's the big curse. You don't want mom, your mom curse you that. I know it's kind of weird, so, you know. I'm not going to forgive my milk. Okay. I'll go get a Walmart milk. You know? okay. But it's a big curse. It's a big curse because whenever you, your mom said that, that means you will, you will go to hell for sure. So uh, I said, no worry, mother. I will go and make him Muslim. Didn't work out so well. My dad was a believer in Christ by his word. He goes to Catholic church in uh, Turkey every Sunday, which they speak French and uh, Turkish, partially, which he didn't speak neither very well. <laughs> we just go there and sit down and listen to the French priest speaking uh, hour, hour a week. I re my dad gave me a Bible with my language, which a missionary, uh, a Baptist missionary, I think a Baptist, perhaps, Baptist missionary gave him a, a Bible with his language, so he started reading it, and he gave me the Bible also, told me to read Matta or Matthew and John. I said, okay, I'll read it. I read the, the, through the story, and it was weird. I never read something like that, and I said, this is weird. Quran, drop, dropping this, this, is, this Bible is not true. My belief, my Bible, my Quran is the truth. I didn't believe in it, but I didn't tell my dad like that. I told him, it's okay. I'll come to church with you. It's disrespectful to our father if we speak back to them, so we just obey whatever they say. In Turkey, as a refugee, the life was difficult. Let me tell you about refugee life. Refugees in Turkey, especially, I think now it's become more difficult. But when we were there too, it was also difficult. When you're a refugee, you're basically a legal immigrant in that country. You're not allowed to work, nor you go to school. So I missed four years of the school when I was in Turkey. I didn't go to school for four years. My dad go and work illegally, and police caught him a couple of times. And uh, they sent us to a small city called Nefshahir. And it was a cold city. It was very cold. I don't know why I got sent us to cold places. It's just they shouldn't exist. <laughs> Everywhere should be like Texas. <laughs> it is snow. It is snow so much. It's not up to your knee. And it was very hard because we didn't have a gas, we didn't have anything to warm up ourselves, so we have to go and steal woods, bring them up, up the hill, because we had a small house up the hill, and break them up and put them in the place that we make a fire, so it will be warm. They went many times hungry and thirsty in Turkey. My brother was so skinny in that time that I could see his bones through his skin. Right now he's very chubby, he's, he's very fat, <laughs> because he finds Walmart. Walmart is a blessing. Um, <laughs> refugee life is difficult. It's not, it is not easy at all. And we suffered. We suffered through many times. And during that time, you know, I ask, I ask God, I ask Allah, I ask the, you know, the, the guy up there, why? why? 
why we go through so much suffering? What is the, what is the reason? What is the purpose? What I have done? Maybe I have done something wrong, but what have this kid done? You know, this kid is the best time of his life. He needs to watch TV and watch cartoon and, you know, eat some okay food and play with the other kids. And right now he's always at home, doesn't play anything. He's just getting skinny. He's, it's not good. What, what did he do wrong? I was very upset about that. I heard nothing. Silent voice. Nothing come to me. After about three years, the UN department accepted our case and said, okay, you are a real refugee. Your life is really in danger in your, in your country, which partially was true. Uh, my dad, some people were trying to kill him in Iran because of the political and uh, just the family problems. They give us, so whenever you're a refugee also, there is an, another thing. You don't choose what country you go from there. There are five major countries that take refugees. The three major ones that take most refugees are United States, Canada, and Australia. Those countries are in need of laborers, or they, are, they have a larger land as a general, so they accept more refugees. The other two countries in Europe are Finland and Norway. They also need a lot of um, labor because their country is very small and the last people are there. So we, we want to go to Finland because we heard that country is a country who take care of their citizens very well and, and they, are, they, are, uh, they give you money and they give you a car and they give you a house and we were like, yes, let's go there. <laughs> Sounds great. But they gave us to America. We were happy. We were like, as long as we live from this country because we suffered through so much. We went through the American Embassy, passed our uh, interview, passed our um, medical and uh, all the exams and all the interviews, and they gave us a flight date. We were so excited that we have flight dates, that we travel to Istanbul, the city that we were gonna fly from. One week early, we will not miss our flight. We, we went to the airport one day early, make sure we're not gonna miss our flight. We were just ready to leave. And that day, I remember, i never forget this, my dad and I were talking, and we talked to each other and we say, we hate this country. We'll never come back here. We hate it. We are so glad that we're leaving from this country. That strong feeling was so strong that that, that, that felt real, that, that felt right to hate this country. And we were so happy that we're leaving because we suffered through so much. We came to America, they gave us a city called Mobile. We thought it was Mobile, it's Mobile, Alabama. <laughs> First we thought it's the city that make cell phones, but we find out that's not the truth either. <laughs> you just call it Mobile for what, mo Mobile for whatever reason that they have. A small, a small town, beautiful town, a small town, and we didn't know why they sent us there. We went there and uh, I started going to high school Oh, I cannot forget this moment. Whenever we went there, we f finally saw a refrigerator after two, three years. And we opened the refrigerator and we saw some um, banana muffin. We're like, look at these cakes are so big. They have nuts in top. It's great. <laughs> we were so happy. I went to high school. My brother went to the school and my dad got a job as a dishwasher at the IHOP. And, um, he got other job too, but he quit that job. He always does, he quit his jobs. After about eight months, um, now let me give you something about Turkey also. My relationship with, with, with my dad was cold, going cold and colder in Turkey. And the, one of the reasons was because he was a single man, he did not remarry, he did not have any other relationship with other women, and he was going through so much difficulty as a, as a single father with two kids through that hardship. And he felt, he felt alone. And I was not that emotional support that he was looking for. Because I was young, so I did not know this till now, today, when I realized, when I look back. And our relationship was cold, colder, and colder. Because I was saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. It was, it was just a 
way of the respect that, that, that we talk to our father. We never look to their eyes. We never say anything other than just respect. When we come to Turkey, my father, when we come to America, after eight months, my father realized that this country is not the country that will meet his dream. His American dream was crushed because he has to start from zero again. His job was a tailor. He made clothes from top to the bottom. He made everything. He's very good at it. And he couldn't find a job because he couldn't speak English. He doesn't have a certification. He doesn't have, um, you know, the, the relations. He doesn't have that um, thing that he needs to be a tailor in, in America. And he thought it's going to be easy. So he decided that he wants to go back. He wants to go back to Turkey and become a citizen there so that he can start his company in Turkey because he could speak a language. He could he know the culture of Turkey. He, he, was, he was doing well if he was a citizen in Turkey. And when I heard that, I remember the, the, that conversation that we had in Turkey. We hate this country. We'll never come back here again. And for the first time, I told my dad, no. And I look at his eyes. And that's a disrespect thing to do. But I did not want to go back. I was going to high school after four years. I was having a good, good life. And I was, and I was this, this is it. This is, this is grass right here. This is trees here. It's beautiful. It's, I'm going to school. They give a free lunch. That's great. What else do you want? And that night, was the end. My dad kicked me out that night and I become homeless. It was about 9 p.m. I walked toward downtown toward my caseworker office and as I was walking toward downtown, you know, I felt, I felt sad and I don't usually feel so sad because I consider myself I am a tough skin, you know, like we've been through so much, I'm tough skin. Don't feel sad, it's okay. But I really feel sad when I was walking toward downtown. I was thinking, I lost everything. There's nothing left. I saw a dumpster. I went next to it where all my clothes would put all my towel and my backpack to my head because it was cold. I hate cold weather. And I started falling asleep. And as I was falling asleep, I told God, Jesus, God, whatever you are, where are you now? I'm in the lowest time, lost my family, lost my mother, country, father, culture, brother, lost everything. There is nothing left. So where are you now? I fall asleep. I heard nothing again. I fall asleep. And uh, I know you usually expect that a Muslim guy see a dream in that moment, that Jesus come and save them. But no, there was, there was no dream in that moment. I, w I, I wake up the next day. My caseworker takes me to school and... They find me a place to stay. This pastor guy let me stay in his house for one week. And when I saw the pastor guy, he, had, he was kind of fat, and his hair was all up right, like this, and I thought he was a child molester. I was like, I know, but I have no choice, so I guess we go. So I give thumbs up to my caseworker, and I went to this uh, pastor house, that I thought he was not a safe man. Um, find out he have a wife, praise the Lord. He have two daughters and one son He's around my age, so he let me stay in his basement. He gave me a Bible with my language. He said, start reading it. And I said, I read it before. And he said, read it again. Okay. After one week, he asked me to stay one more week, and one more week, and one more week, and one more week. And I keep reading, and keep reading, keep reading. Go. And I go to his church on Sunday. That was the rule. After sixth week, one day going toward the church, he takes me to the church with his car, stand in front of a yard, and he said, Masood, if nobody loves you, Jesus loves you. If you don't have father, he will be your heavenly father. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he's knocking on a door. You know what door I'm talking about. And I said, the door of my heart. And he smiled and he said, yes. He said, if you open the door of your heart, he will come in. He will clean everything. He will forgive your sin. And you have a free ticket to heaven. Would you like to do that? I was like, yes. 
That sounds like a great deal. Why, would I, why wouldn't I? And at that moment, I gave my life to Christ. Four and a half years ago, I was born again inside a car in front of a church. Just doing that, confessing and believing in my heart. And I was born again, become a convert to Christian, to Son of God. Today, our text is 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bible, please open your Bible to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 12. Let's pray before we read. Father, we are here for you. We are here to receive your word. I pray to open the eyes, open the hearts, open the ears. Father, give understanding, word of knowledge and wisdom. We are here to hear from you. Holy Spirit, speak to us. You are a good Father. We love you, and we praise you, and we will worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read from verse 7 to 10. This is going to be our text for today. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weaknesses. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insult, hardship, persecution, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Praise the Lord. The word said, my power is perfected in weakness. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Are you feeling weak? Are you feeling discouraged? Are you feeling when you go to work, when you go to home, when you see your wife, when you see your family, when you come to church, do you feel discouraged? Do you ever feel discouraged? Do you ever feel sad, depressed? Do you, ever, do you ever feel that? You'd be surprised how discouragement is a, a thorn in the flesh right now in the body. Many ministers feel discouraged. Discouraged about the ministry, how the ministry goes. You'd be surprised how many people are discouraged when they go to work. Discouraged about how their boss doesn't see how hard they work. They're discouraged at how their, their husband or their wife does not see how much they give life and, 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 and they give love to the family. You'd be surprised how many, how many people are discouraged in their life. But the Bible says whenever you are weak, whenever you are discouraged, whenever you are weak, whenever you are weak, then you are strong. What kind of philosophy is that? When I am weak, then I am strong. It does not make any sense. It's not even grammar right. Even I know that. <laughs> what kind of philosophy is that? The problem is that it's not a philosophy. It's not a poetry. It's not a saying. It's not, it's not a religion. It's not even a relationship. It's a revelation. 
When you are weak, then you are strong. It's a revelation. The power of God is a revelation. God is powerful. You don't need to make him powerful or let his power work. His power works without you. It's a revelation. It must reveal to you. Paul knew that. Paul knew that completely. In chapter 8, Paul, in the same, same letter, Paul writing to Corinthians and saying, and, and telling the Corinthians, look at the Macedonian churches. Look how much they are in suffering, how much they are poor, but they are still generous. They are still joyful. They are overflowed with joy in the midst of suffering. In the midst of poorness, extreme poorness, they are giving money beyond their ability. They don't know where this money comes from. They're just giving it. Paul knew that. It was a revelation that was revealed to Paul. Have you ever feel weak, then you feel strong? Do you remember any testimony in your life? Whenever you fall, then you wake up, you get up stronger. Somebody raised you stronger. If you don't, that's all right. Some testimony in the Bible. The Bible is very clear about that. And, you know, Paul knew about this. Paul knew about this is a story that I'm gonna, about to tell you, but this was not revealed to him. Moses, remember the story of Moses? The Hebrew children were in slavery for 400 years, they were in slavery. They were just working four generations, more generations, working as the slaves. They were very weak, very weak. And then God rose a leader, a man, the power stopped manifesting in their life. He rose the Red Sea to two parts, and they walk. If it's not power, what is it that rose those seas? And these weak people are walking through. And then strong people are coming, and they clap the sea over them. If it's not power, what is it? David, a young boy, killed Goliath with one piece of stone. If that's not weak, beating, becoming strong, what is it? Nehemiah. I love Nehemiah. Nehemiah, a cupbearer, not very strong, powerful man. He got permission from the king, Cyrus, and went and started rebuilding the wall. One sword in one hand and the brick in the other hand. Rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. If that's not weak, becoming powerful, what is it? Do you know the name of all those people who built the wall are in the Bible? The name of all those people are in the, in the Bible. Sometimes I think like the names are just so unimportant. The whole chapter of names. But their names is in here, in the holy word of God. Some more. Noah. How about Noah? Everybody, they thought he's dumb. He's, he's a crazy guy building a ship. They never see rain, they, they never see rain before. Building an ark, building a ship, what are you doing? Built a boat at least. There is, there is no rain. There is, there is nothing there. And you know what? The rain come. And he rose in rain. And all those people are, went under the rain. They all drowned and died. If that's not weakness becoming powerful, what is it? Joseph. His brothers hated him. They sold him to, uh, to Ishmaelites. He even became a slave. Then he went to jail because they accused him as a sexual, immoral person and put him in, in, in the jail. You know what happened? God rose him. He became the powerful man in Egypt. Egypt was the strongest country in planet Earth. He became the strongest man in planet Earth after Pharaoh. He has the same power as Pharaoh. If that's not weakness to power, what is it? Paul. He suffered over and over and over and over. So much suffering for Paul. Man, we can't even imagine how much suffering he went through, how much he was stoned, in jail, in darkness. 
in chapter 8, he said he gave up on his life. He's like, we're going to die. If that's not weakness to power, what is it? Now, probably you know about this one, Jesus. The Word of God says, the Word became flesh. The Word, you know what is the Word in Genesis? The Word speak and things create. The Word speaks and the light come about to be happened. The Word speaking, just, you know how Jesus make breakfast? Breakfast. The word, powerful, powerful word of God, humble himself and come to the flesh, weaken himself by his own will. He was not weak, he was able, but he willingly come to the flesh, humble himself. And then what? And nobody noticed him. He come and walk as a man, but he was God. Nobody noticed him. Like, who is this, this guy with long hair and he doesn't put his deodorant on. <laughs> Who is this guy? Nobody noticed him. These people did not know, n- nobody knew him. And then you know what happened in the end? They captured him. They beat him. Beat him. Beat him again. Whip and whip. You cannot see his skin. You know what else they did? They put a crown of thorn in his head. Isn't it sound similar to the text that we just read? A thorn in the flesh was given to me. You know, word thorn, the first time it's used in the Bible, is in Genesis chapter 3. Whenever Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed Adam and said, from now on, the earth will produce thorn because of your sin, because of your disobedience. Thorn will grow in the earth, and you will eat with the sweat of your forehead. The word thorn used four times in the New Testament. Okay? Two times, Jesus used in a parable. The other time, they put it in Jesus' head. And the fourth time is right here in this text that we just read. Used only four times. That's it. Jesus put the thorn the curse in his head. They push it in his head. So much suffering. They take him to the, they, he carried the cross. He was so weak that he couldn't carry the cross all the way to the Calvary. Somebody else carried it for him. He was so weak. I know it sometimes maybe it sounds weird to say Jesus was weak. He was able, guys. He was able, but he was weak. Willingly, he led himself. Then you know what happened? They nailed him to the cross. They put one nail here, one nail here, and one nail in his two feet. He couldn't move on the cross. Isn't that weak? He couldn't move. He could if he wanted to. But he let himself to be weak. You know, weakness is a special thing. You might not think so. Weak. Whenever we are weak, whenever we are so weak, then we die. That's the end of the weakness. If you are not weak, you won't die. You will stay alive. The strong will live. The weak will die. Jesus was so weak. He was so weak. And then God put the sins of the whole world on the perfect lamb. On the perfect lamb, he put the sins of the whole world, the sins of past, present, and future. He put all the sins, gathered up on him. And in the book of Isaiah, it talks about that. He says, whenever the whole sins of the whole world was put on him, you couldn't recognize him because the sin affected his look even. It was so much. And in that moment, in that moment, God's wrath punished all the sin. You know, the Bible says, how furious is it to be in the hands of God? And God punished God's wrath for whole sin in the world. It was put on Jesus, and Jesus paid for all the sins of you, of me, for past, for future. He 
pay for all the sins. Hallelujah. In that moment, Jesus died, and they put him in a grave. After three days, as he said, for God about to raise him. You better believe that all the evil spirit, all the devils trying to keep that stone not to move and not let Jesus come out of that tombstone. All the devil spirits trying to stop Jesus to raise him from the dead because they know he become a savior when he rose. All right. But you know, God's power, and that moment, God's power, the most powerful thing, rose Jesus from the dead. And Jesus rose with glory, rose with power, rose with all authority, rose almighty. That's how he rose from the dead. You know, Jesus says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me now. Okay? He rose from the dead. He rose with glory. He rose with power. Those are the testimonies that we see when we are weak, then we are strong. Hallelujah. There's a problem we have. We have a problem as a society. We have a problem, and that problem is that we don't go to God. Okay? We don't go to God. The world does not know God, but we know God, okay? They don't know God, so how they can go to God when they don't know God? We know God, and even we sometimes don't go to God when we have problems. We try to fix it ourselves. We try to medicate it ourselves. I can do it. You know what we do? If there's a financial problem, what we do is I get a second job, I get a third job, fourth job, fifth job. I'm going to work like an animal. I'm going to work and make it myself. I'm going to prosper myself. If I have a family problem in my family, I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to read some books about family relationships. I'm going to fix it myself. I'm going to go and pay some money to a witch, and with that money that I give to the witch, she's going to pray and fix my family. We're trying to fix it ourselves. We're trying to give, give our all to fix it. It's my problem. I can fix it. That's the problem in our society today. We're trying to medicate and fix everything ourselves. And listen to this one. It's perhaps one of the most important things I will say today. A sign of weakness is not recognizing we have a problem. A sign of weakness is receiving, is recognizing we need help. Let me say it again. A sign of weakness is not recognizing we have a problem. That's not weakness. When you find out you have a problem, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you're weak. If you're weak, if you have a problem, it doesn't mean you're weak. A sign of weakness is recognizing we need help. If you are weak, you need help. If you can fix it, if you, if you can fix it your, yourself, then you are not weak. The problem is that we don't think we are weak. We think we are strong. We can do all things ourselves. We can handle all ourselves. We don't need any help then you are not weak, then you are strong. Then you don't need God because you're strong enough to handle all yourself. I can handle all myself. I thought about that so many times myself. Whenever we, we believe that we are weak, that means we need help. If you say you need help, say I need help. Say I need God.
Whenever we say we need help, that means we are weak and we need God. And whenever we are weak, then we are strong. Why don't we go to God and ask God to fix all our problems? If somebody in our family is not a believer, we go to God, pray, pray, share the gospel, share the word over and over. If somebody in our family is, 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 is sad or is, is broken or is sick, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of problems in family. There's a lot of dramas. At least it is my, in, in my family. I don't know. You, you're probably all perfect. I don't know. My family is not perfect. My family have problems. And we need to learn to, to go to God and say, we are weak, God. I need you. And, you know, I was talking to my wife, and my wife was telling me, maybe not say weak. Because the weak of the society today, we as a Christian even, we don't want to be called weak. We don't want to say, I am weak. We are so prideful. We don't want to say we are weak. Man, take that pride. Crush it. Smash it. Smash it. Put it under your feet. Do it like this, and then kick it out. Say, I am weak. I don't need that pride. That pride is not going to help me. Be humble. Jesus was humble. He did not need to be humble, but he became humble. The word become flesh. So we would know how to do it. He showed us example. He was humble. Are we humble? Are we trying to be humble? Are we saying that, God, I'm weak. I cannot handle this. Help me right now in the name of Jesus. Fix this financial situation for me right now in the name of Jesus. Fix my family right now in the name of Jesus. Fix this relationship right now in the name of Jesus. Fix my job in the name of Jesus. Man, it's not take that much time. You know, you don't have to pray like three days and fast, I don't know, one month. God is right there in your heart. You don't have to make the sky open for you to God hear you. You know, people like making this stuff that you have to pray over and over and and make revival and all this stuff for God to hear you. No, that's why you bow your head because God is right here inside you. In Jesus' name. He's right here in your heart. You don't have to even look over your nose. You can see him right there, wherever he, like he's with you. He's with you. He goes with you. He never leaves you. That's his promise. Let us be humble. Let us recognize we need help, not we have problems. Hallelujah. Don't make it hard on yourself. Don't make it hard on yourself. It is an easy solution for all your problem. Jesus is an easy solution. Easy. Man, that's a revelation, brothers and sisters. For me, it's a revelation. Jesus is an easy solution for all our problems. Weakness. Weakness. Now, getting all these things together. Now, okay, getting all these things together. Weakness is only a state of mind if you are a believer in Christ. Because whenever you are weak, then you are strong. Whenever you are weak, then you are strong. Then God raises you more stronger. So look at your weakness as an opportunity to be strong. Your weaknesses are opportunity. Now, I can't preach on that with one more hour about that. I mean, weaknesses. Like, bring example, okay? You're driving in the street. Somebody, I'm, I'm sure no, no, nobody caught you here in this beautiful town. But in Houston, oh, my Lord. <laughs> you got to go to Catholic priest and confess all our sin to him. It's crazy in Houston. Drivers are crazy. But whenever that guy or, or woman, I don't want to be sexist, caught you or don't let you in, uh, either way, don't be upset. Don't be mad. Say, this is an opportunity for me to grow as a person. If somebody in your family, if your son or your daughter, your father, your mother, messing up with you, you know, not doing what you tell them to do or not obeying you, not respecting you, Look at it as an opportunity to grow. 
then you become strong. It's not a philosophy, it's not a religion, it's not a practice, it's a revelation. It must be revealed to you. And you know revelation? Revelation is not something that, you know, we learn or something like that. It's, it's there. It's, it's already there. And our eyes just open. Jesus was the revelation about the Old Testament. The glory was revealed through Jesus. The glory who was, which was fading away through Jesus is eternal glory now. It's a revelation. It's a revelation. Hallelujah. Wow, I have to speak a lot of time in Jesus' name. I lost my time, sorry. Today, we're going to close with this conclusion. Let me continue on my story, on my testimony. What happened? You know, testimonies are three parts. One part is the beginning, before Christ. The one other part is when you meet Christ. And the, more, the most important one is what happened to you after Christ. Who you become. Who are you in Christ? Who are you in new creation? Who are you, son? Who are you, daughter? Who are you? And you know, I heard many testimonies that people share and just miracles. People like, you know, get emotional, but I didn't get emotional when I received Jesus. When I received Christ, not everything changed in that moment, but that moment, that moment in the car changed everything. Not everything become butterfly and ice creams. Hallelujah. Not everything become better. Your walk is not easier. It's become more difficult. But the problem that the, they're not leaving you. The problems are actually become more because the devil come after you now. You are a son. If you don't have problem, then probably you're going the same direction as Satan goes. You don't go after each other. But you receive a life. You receive a solution for all your problems. You fight your battle. No, Jesus fights your battle. After I received Christ, I got saved. I got life. I got a new purpose, brand new purpose for my life. How good it feels to have a purpose. I received love, 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 so much love. And man, the love of Christ is a revelation that reveals to you all the time. There is more into it. If you are believing in Christ for a long time, I was believing in Christ for three and a half years, four years, and just got a new revelation of love of Christ in my, in my heart this last August. I was like, God loves me. He carried my picture in his wallet. He loves me so much. He does. You are his son. You're his daughter. Don't you carry your son and daughter picture in, in, in your wallet? Don't you show your picture of your son and daughter to others? He have your picture in 8 by 4 in his house. Like, that's my son. That's my daughter. She's beautiful. He's handsome. Love, love, love. I received so much joy. I was prosper financially, okay? I'm not going to preach prosperity here. But I was prosper financially. But even when I was poor, I am now, I still feel rich. I still feel blessed. Amen. This is me. This is my life. Man, nobody can say I'm poor because I am rich. I'm a son of king. That's who you are. Today, as we're going to close this message, I want to give you opportunity. God wants to give you opportunity. A chance. He's always ready for you. If you have not received him, talk to your pastor. Come up and pray. Ask somebody. If you're struggling, he wants to give you opportunity to raise from your struggle. Raised from your problem. He wants to raise you from the dead. 
raise you from problem, make you strong, make you powerful, make you magnificent, make you great. That's what he wants to make you. That's how you're going to feel when you go to Jesus and ask for help from him. That's how Paul felt whenever he go to God. That's why he was joyful. He wrote one of the most joyful letters of all time, Philippians. Oh, my goodness. When he was in so much suffering, when you go to God, that happened to you. He gives you joy that no one can give you. Only God can bless you, and he will when you ask him. Praise the Lord. Let's pray.